Ah, il est passé oh sur la oh super oh l'artiste Super oh Encore un but sensationnel Oh, that's right, boy That's a brilliant bit of follow up play by my head Oh my goodness, man, what a shot Sagol said Sagol to set the head A set the head I don't want to act like a superstar. I want to be a nice guy who does great things on the handball court and also some nice things off the court. Sander Sagason. I think he did a nice thing off the court by joining us today on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> and we've all seen the major things he's done on the court. But yes, what an amazing guest we have here in our second preview episode of the HF Euro 2022. Sander Sagason coming up in just a minute. But firstly, I'll introduce Chris O'Reilly. Hello, hello. And Alex Kulesh. Hey, Brian. Hey, Alex. (laughs) (laughs) You backed out of it there. (laughs) Yeah, what a what a second guest to have on. We've had some pretty good fortune with our particularly our Euro related podcast, but podcasts in general. I mean, I was just thinking about it after doing the interview today. And comparing it to like, uh, there's a podcast group that Alex and I really like called Second Captains, which is a an Irish based podcast. And you know they dedicate like pretty much every day of the week to doing podcasts, mostly on sport. And they rarely get names of that level, like in the sports that they cover. And I think in handball, we're so lucky that over the whatever, the 140 episodes we're almost coming on, that so many of them have been graced by like the biggest names in the sport. So I'm very thankful about just how accessible most of them are. Most of them. Oh. Not all players, but most players are. And I think it's a great example of that today. And just how nice they all are. You know, we've had some good chats, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think that just says a lot about what you're going to hear, people uh, listening in a couple of minutes when we get into it. Before we go into the interview, when we talked about the, the Hungary team, in the last podcast, we had the overriding question of whether this was one of the best teams, like historically one of the best handball nations not to get a medal in men's handball. And in a couple of years, we might be looking back on this Norway team and wondering if they're the best team to have never won a major championship, if they don't win it in the next couple of years. Because this team has been really, ever since 2016, and they made their big breakthrough, they've been in the top four basically and predicted by people like myself over and over again to win championships but yet to do it has it surprised the two of you that they actually haven't managed to pick up gold yet yeah it's 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 kind of difficult to answer a question because we we do always pick them to win and they do always look amazing but it just speaks to the the quality right at the top of handball and that it takes just something absolutely special to to win a championship and when you think back of kind of the dominate dominant teams of the past like France maybe Denmark these days you have to appreciate just how incredible they are that they can win these tournaments when teams like Hungary and Norway that we talk about haven't been able to I think I was surprised in 2020 that they didn't win it because I was there pretty much for all of their games and they did look like they were on a different level to each team, the other teams that I saw there. And especially today's guest, Sander Sags and his tournament was, he looked unplayable for most of it. And that game against Croatia, that could, if that was two minutes longer, it could have went Norway's way. It was just back and forward. So. I tried to say as neutral as possible, but I remember feeling a little bit disappointed that, that they didn't make it to the final in 2020. It's going to be interesting to see now what they're going to do this time around because I think a lot of teams know how they play now and it's a very, very attractive style of of handball. I don't know if you know Ralph Raniak, the interim coach of Man United, and he talks about rock and roll. Not personally. No, but he talks about <laughs> rock and roll football, uh, high tempo pressing entertaining and i think probably maybe norway play a version of rock and roll handball as well which is uh always uh, great to watch all all gas no brakes kind of stuff yeah and i think that's why we are drawn to them because they play such an amazing style 
and it's really driven by one man, and that is Anders Sagerson. He makes the rock and roll happen. He is the lead guitarist slash lead singer slash gets a red card once in a while. <laughs> so that's truly <laughs> rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, he was a well, top scorer in the last Euro, uh, was the absolute hero of that championship. And uh, I think it's a it's a nice segue into the interview itself. We're going to talk a little bit about what he said and uh, our own memories of his career in international handball. So let's hear from the man himself, Sander Sagerson. Hello. Hello, Sander. Hello, Sander. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. And Happy New Year. Too. Happy New Year. Right, we'll, we'll dive straight into it. Yeah, we're starting the new year with a pretty big guest, I think it's fair to say. Uh, one of the biggest handball players in the world right now, Sander Sagerson. Happy New Year to you. And uh, where are you talking to us from? First of all, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm talking to We are in Copenhagen right now uh, with the national team here, uh, training for um, making our preparation for, the, for a championship. And yeah, I'm happy to start the new year good and be back with the boys with the national team. So we're having fun. Brilliant. When we talk about international handball on this podcast, we always say it's it's really special. The kind of the passion it brings out of the players, the passion it brings out of fans and the general buzz. Would you say that it brings something special out of you? Yeah, of course. It's something special to play for me on the biggest stage and for my country, for my yeah, with my really, really good friends here with the national team who has been together with ups and downs. So yeah, it brings a lot of emotions. We to go out on the court to look at the Norwegian jersey and know that you play for the nation, that's that's for sure really special. And do you think those emotions are what drives you on the court and the way you play? Yeah, for sure. Uh, like I, I, I always feel I have a lot of emotion. I have to say, uh, for national team and for for Taylor Keel. Uh, but but of course it brings something special from you. And yeah, it's sad uh, the last the last years or last year when we didn't have fans in in Egypt or in in Tokyo. Of course that we miss. Of course because we want our fans, the national team fans, the club fans, and everything. Let's bring this extra level of emotions but uh but of course i go out there everything and put my heart on on the court i i i try to do every time i was talking to you before this interview and we wanted to lay out what the what we would talk about and we discussed very briefly about some of your highlights of playing past european championships and i think we threw it out also on social media and i think probably the the most clear image of sandra sagerson playing for norway was your games in trondheim in 2020 what are your general memories of that? Is that like a, a fantastic blur or do you have very crystal clear memories of those games? I have played some some really, really big games uh, in my career, but that is the funnest game I've ever played because it was so special for me to to be home in my hometown, uh, wanting this uh, championship for so long. And, and yeah, this uh, game against France where... Yeah, we played an amazing game. The arena was full. I looked to the right, I looked to the left. It was friends everywhere, family. Uh, it was so special. And yeah, the Brett brought the best of me uh, in, into the game. And I think for the whole team as well, we just flew on. Yeah, this this flow for the whole championship, that's made us, this game so special for us and, and for me as well. A lot of the squad would be, this, would be some of the same players who played in Trondheim as well. Is that something you bring up in preparation for this Euro that, Think back to Toronto time, try to get that atmosphere going again. 100% that uh, we have to be honest and say that it was yeah, uh, our best competition. Like we played the, the best handball I think this team has ever played. And we want to create this atmosphere once again, uh, going into a new Euro now and look back and see what did we do good? What, what even what can we do better? Uh, but to bring back this atmosphere and yeah, this feeling in the team where we, we are just a group of friends going around, having fun, training, uh, go all in on the trainings. And then we go go back after, eat dinner and joke with each other all the time. So it, it's something special. And then we have to bring back. And I think we are in a good place right now. That's a really interesting way to talk about it. Because when you talk about home nation teams and uh, the way they've built up the championships, a lot of teams, a lot of athletes would naturally feel a lot of pressure that comes with it as well. But the way you're talking about it, particularly with the group dynamic of the team, it sounds like all the pressure almost 
disappeared for that first week of the championship and it was more of an enjoyable experience. Do you think that that's a difficult thing to try and replicate? Or is that something that, that recently now you're actually considering, okay, maybe we have to, to stop overthinking a little bit? Yeah, but you said really good there because, uh, yeah, the last five, six years with the national team, we go from from not being a contender to one championship, go to be the biggest contender, and then it goes like a roller coaster. And yeah, it's a new process for us as well to 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 bring on this pressure and expectations from from the humble world. We have to say, and yeah, that it's what we work a lot with as a group, and me personally as well to to take away this pressure, just go out, have fun. The worst thing that can happen is just if you lose a humble game. And, and that's sport. That's what we love about it. That's that's how it is. And if you think and lose too much energy thinking about the consequences of not performing, then you will not perform because you lost 50% uh, of your energy just thinking about it. So that's what we work a lot with here with the national team. And we are just really good friends. We have fun. We play table tennis and we play PlayStation and we have competition. Like we, we take away the, how to say, seriousness about it. But, but we are 100% focused when we are focused. And when we are off court, we just enjoy each other's environment and, and prepare as good as possible. And, and maybe looking back at that breakthrough in uh, 2016, where Norway came out of nowhere uh, in the general handball world, uh, finished fourth after finishing 14th in the previous championship. What, what was the step change there that, that allowed that breakthrough? That's a good question, uh, because we wasn't even in the championship in Qatar 2015. And then the Euro before, we was, like you say, uh, uh, far away from, from, from the breakthrough. But uh, I think the biggest change for this group was we were starting to believe like we as a team believe that we have good players we have good quality uh, okay if we play the best we can do and france or denmark or yeah at that time croatia or germany who won spain if they play at their best as well then it will be hard but if we play as best as we can and they are losing five to ten percent then we are up there then we can take the fight against them and i think for us it was this feeling of believing that we have something here to do we and then we just grow with the task, if you can say it like that. We was just like every time performing, we get more and more self-esteem, uh, more and more like bringing it into the game and could like take another step for every game to game. And yeah, I think that was the key. We we're just going on a wave and just flowing with it, if you can say it like that. It's interesting because the, the team this year is quite similar to the team from already six years ago it's it's kind of crazy to think that this core has been together and it's become such a big part of the humble world everyone knows it um do you feel that there's any stagnation or do you still fully believe in this in this squad that, that exists right now because a lot of times you know golden generations have their time are you still in the golden generation for a long while yeah but that i hope for sure uh and in 2016 we were still a pretty young group, uh, we can say it like that. And that's unique that we made this uh, generation switch uh, pretty, pretty early there and, and like stayed together. And yeah, still that we have been together for six, seven years. Uh, I've been national team for almost eight years. Still, I'm pretty young, I can say. I'm not I'm not going on the old, uh, old card yet. So, so I think this uh, group has the best in front of it. But uh, Top Hamel is so hard. It's so small details, margins, who, who, who decide who wins or lose. And yeah, of course, the last two championships, we didn't get the result we wanted. But I 100% believe in this group and in this uh, team uh, to succeed in, in the future now. Just going to, to 2016 there again, you mentioned like it was this step-by-step -step process, but was there a certain, can you think back to a certain point in Poland that you, as a group or individually, maybe you didn't want to tell the others that you felt this way, but you're like, okay, actually, you know, we can start getting medals here. Yeah, but we, we said it pretty, pretty far, well, like in Poland we lost, or I don't remember exactly, I think we lost the first game to Iceland with one goal. Mm -hmm. And and then it was like we have Croatia and next game you lose that game you're out you know, and we was like okay but uh, sorry to say but fuck it like we have nothing to lose we can go in there and and 
put our shoulders down and just enjoy enjoy playing in championship and it's a great atmosphere and that's what we did we got the uh, i think it was a draw against uh, croatia that second game and then we beat belarus in the last one and then suddenly it was true in the group with the highest highest uh, or with the with the biggest points and and then we just like okay but now with things flowing we have nothing to lose we go there we enjoy every game and uh, yeah and of course the last game we have there against France for if we win we go to semi final if they win they go to semi final and we played uh, an amazing handball game and we won it pretty clear uh, then you just start believing that's that's how it is you just like okay we're here now it's what's the next step and it was a completely new situation for us to to be in a semi final to to handle everything around it. You know, it's it's something extra going into these final weekends. And yeah, I didn't secure the medal then, but um, then in 2020 we we was there in the semi final weekend. It didn't go totally as we planned, but still we got a medal. You know, and and you have to take this learning process and yeah, learn something from them because it gives you something extra every time. And what do you think now that you've actually been through all of these championships and, and you said you take these learnings away and it is a learning process, what is the key to actually you know, succeeding? I mean, it's it's hard to, to answer as having not actually gone all the way to the gold yet, but what do you think are the, the key things that you need to? You have, of course, won gold in a final weekend with Kiel last year, but is, what are the... The things maybe besides the obvious that you feel are important on a maybe a team level or a preparation level. Yeah, but that's so 100, 200 things that has to yeah. succeed. You know, it's it's a list of things we talked about it yesterday with the team. What 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 should we do? And like it's easy to say our t- our goal is to 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 win everything. But but to to get to this point, you have a checklist of two hundred things you have to do, and you have to start from day one, the second of January when we meet. We have to do everything right from second of January to the final final weekend, you know. And and yeah, of course we we want to perform. That's that's our biggest goal now as a team. We want to go out there and play the best handball we can play and perform in every every game. And let's see how how long that could take us now. And we don't need to feel some pressure or anything. We just go out there and enjoy enjoy playing because. It's the funniest game we play in a season somehow. It's playing with the national team and in a big championship. So so I think our goal is like to say, yeah, we want to win everything. We have to start performing and we have to play really good. And that has to be our goal in every game and every training. You talk there collectively about not having any uh, pressure on yourselves. But what about you personally? Do you enjoy a little bit of pressure on yourself to kind of carry the team or maybe hit these 200 little tasks that you talked about earlier? Yeah, but of course I love it when it's pressure on because the way I grown up, it's when it's pressure on that means that means something. That means people have expectation about. That mean for me that's respect of my career that people expect more of me or expect that I play good because then I knew know that okay, but people think I'm 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 at this level list of players who who has to perform, and that I just enjoy because I put this pressure on myself every day anyway. I go to every training and I want to be best. That's how how I'm built and how I'm enjoying this game to to go there and get the best of what I can do out of myself every day. But I love it. I love it when the pressure is the highest and we can just stand there and yeah enjoy it because for me it means the world to play these kind of games to to be in the spotlight to be there and yeah then it's something I learned to just enjoy. Even when you're playing table tennis in the hotel with the guys, are you putting pressure on yourself as well? Of course, that is that is, that is the, uh, where we put the most pressure on us. So we have to, so we, so we have to, we have to put the bar high. Speaking of big games, uh, I think two nations, Norway and France, have played some of the most entertaining and exciting games over the last number of years, and it feels like it's become a classic in the in international handball. Is that? Do you get that feeling? Do you? want to play France this time around? I, I love playing up against the best players. Then I can challenge myself, the team. Then we can get the proof that we we have taken this, the highest step. You know, if you beat France, you beat uh, Denmark or you beat Spain, then, then you're on the list of the top, you know. I love it to play against the best. Then, then we challenge ourselves and, and, and are in this company what we want to be. 
Uh, but of course, I played a lot of national team games against France that I could say. <laughs> Are there any other teams that you're kind of looking at and being like, oh, I'd, I'd love to play against this team in this Euros? Yeah, in Scandinavia, we always love to play against Denmark and, and Sweden and challenge ourselves against this team. And yeah, I have never won a national team game against Spain, so that I really hope, hope for soon. So, But but on, men, on men's championship here, it's so many great teams and so many good teams. Uh, but of course, you have you have the list of these, what I would say, four teams who, who are, are on the top now and to ch- for us to challenge them and see if we can get into this company will will uh, be funny now in the next month. Another big news story that you've been involved in recently is the the big project in Kolstad, which has got a lot of people very excited. The prospect of you eventually going back to Trondheim as well and, and maybe re- replicating some of those experiences. Was the national team any part of your thought process there because i at the time had this theory which the other guy said is nonsense that that bringing these norwegian players back to trondheim and kolstad will kind of form a bit of a, a new core in the national team and, and spend more time together which might translate to to a different type of success yeah but 100 percent. like when that was in my mind as well you was not alone like <laughs> no but for me as well like i have won everything uh, you can win as a club player uh, like the championships what I've been I won Champions League and of course I want to win it as many times as possible that's not what I'm saying but but I really really want the title with Norway as well and to go home to Costa for first of all I could be fit to everything like hopefully uh, but but we have to be honest that the pressure or not pressure the the, um, the how to say it in English the um, the intensity Exactly. The intensity of the games are so much higher in Germany. It's a longer season. You have much more and harder games who also uh, increase you as a humble player. But for your physicality, it's, it's hard that we have to be honest about. That is, it's hard to play Bundesliga because of the travelings, the games, the, the calendar year. It's so many games. And that would be easier in 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 uh, in Kolstad. Uh, and we will. Uh, but on the other hand, we will still hopefully have the highlights with the Champions League and playing and challenging the best team in the Europe uh, back in Trondheim. And then, of course, we can bring the national team even more closer and, and develop in that uh, extra part that can bring us the title with the with the national team. So, so are you trying to convince some of the the guys to join Kolstad now? Let's see. <laughs> if I win this game of table tennis, you join me. Is that the rules? <laughs> exactly. Um, I have to have to step up my table tennis the game. <laughs> Sander, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, no problem, guys. Lovely to talk to you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in Hungary as well in a couple of weeks. That I hope as well, and yeah. thanks for your time. And then we we'll see you so soon. So there you are, Sandra Sagerson. As I said at the very top of the show in his quote, he didn't want to be a superstar. He wanted to be a nice guy. And I think for a lot of maybe English-speaking people who don't have that much access to handball players in interviews, I think it might be a breath of fresh air to hear someone of his stature who is uh, in such a good mood and so uh, modest and just a generally smiley, happy, positive guy. We did have in mind to ask him about some of the low points, but uh, we just forgot about it. <laughs> it was just he was in such a good mood and kind of put us in a good mood as well that it was uh, it was difficult to go into that. But I think he did refer to he gave a nod towards the the moments in his career so far that haven't been so great and particularly when he talks about his role in the team and like carrying them at times and what i was particularly stuck struck by was when he spoke about the fact that they they've kind of realized that they've put themselves under so much pressure in the last two years and are now trying to take that away from themselves And I think that's very interesting for this particular championship because looking at the squad, looking at some of the players who've retired, like Bjarte Mirhol, or some of the players who were not available for COVID or injury, I'm not expecting as much from them as usual, which at the European Championship usually means they're going to have a fantastic tournament. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I I don't see them as the outright favorites as as we've talked about them in the past um the shine has gone off them a little bit and i think that is down to the the fact that they've been around for so long it's the same team that's been around for so long so long with very little change 
over the last six years. And it's difficult to, you know, sport usually moves in cycles and cycles come to an end. Sanders said himself that he fully believes that, you know, this core that they have right now is good enough and will continue being good enough for a while. But I'm not 100% sure about that. You need some change once in a while. And maybe that's what's maybe helped Nori back a little bit. And uh, you spoke about some of the standout games over the the years with him. And we also heard from you, the listeners, about some of the games that you wanted us to talk about with him. But we also prepared a couple of games ourselves. And uh, we'll start with you, Brian, for which Sanders Augustin moment has uh, stood out for you. Well, I was in the arena for this one. And, and I think that's why um, it was uh, so special for me. It was the very opening game in Tron time of Norway versus uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Shit, that was mine. Ah, well, <laughs> I, I picked a good one. <laughs> and uh, but I remember being in the arena, witnessing that, and it was one of a handful of times that I felt like I've been there, and I felt like I'd, I was witnessing something really special. And you can even tell from the photographs from that game. The, uh, there's, there's a photograph that's been used a million times of him with his arms spread out in front of the crowd. And you could really felt like it was like a, a messiah coming home or something. And it was really incredible. I mean, it was, it was getting goosebumps watching him. And he scored 12 goals in that game. And that really set himself up for the rest of the tournament. And you mentioned earlier, Chris, that he was top scorer of that EHF Euro. But he was also top of assists as well. And he he uh, netted or he's involved in uh, 49% of Norway's goals throughout the whole tournament in some way or the other which is just incredible. Had they won goal that time, I think it would have been the single most, the single best performance by any handball player ever. But uh, unfortunately, fell up short in the, in the semi-final. But that first game for me was a slight hipster pick, but it just set up the whole tournament. And I was thinking, okay, this is, this is going to be a special one. I think it was that moment in particular that uh, stood out for me as well. And I, if I'm not mistaken, it was against Bosnia and Herzegovina. Right, that opening game, and it was a penalty he scored, lobbed the keeper, and then just like spread out the arms, and it's like, yes, I'm here. And, uh, yeah, that was an amazing moment. So definitely agree with that. And we spoke a little bit about the France Norway game in 2016 in Poland. That was a uh, an amazing occasion, uh, and just that was really the the coming out moment for this whole Norway team. And as Sandra himself said, they won that one fairly comfortably in the end. And if you thought their loss against Croatia in the 2020 semifinal was painful, that loss against Germany in the 2016 semifinal was perhaps, oh, not even perhaps, I think that was actually worse. I think time has healed their wounds a little bit there. But in terms of just how tense that was, that went to extra time as well. Uh, Germany won that and then Germany went on to win gold uh which <laughs> was uh was a bizarre way to end that tournament that that final as well which was horrible this is not a norway story anymore but you, brian you were there when you brought your parents right yeah that germany spain final yeah and i was building up the whole tournament and i was like my parents have never seen live handball at that level ever before and i flew them over to poland for the final and, and going on the semi-finals and all the games in the build-up to this i was like this is an absolutely incredible uh tournament and we got there and it was the flattest final i think i've ever been at in my life and they were just like oh yeah thanks for the tickets and they're like oh <laughs> <laughs> my moment was probably i'll go with a similar theme as yours brian where it was the first time i saw sagason play in person and um, that was at the 2020 euros as well but it was a game against hungary it was the first round of the main round stage and it was the first time that I could see just how athletically powerful Sagason is. And I think that tournament in particular, he was just in, in the best shape of his life or something, but he, he took so many shots and each shot, I, I just see just how high he jumps and how powerful the ball flies. He scored seven goals from, uh, I think, nine shots in that game and then took the foot off the pedal in the second half. But it was just seeing that raw power. And I think that was also the tournament where the EHF had the the first stats, you know, the 
height, jump height. And I think one of the shots that he took in that game, his arm was basically about 20 centimeters or t- 10 centimeters higher than a basketball hoop. Just to put that into context, just how incredible and powerful he is as a player. That, and that just blew me away. We well, also spoke a little bit about the future with him as well and that move to Colstad. I'm delighted that uh, my theory has been proven correct, that they're going there basically to to win an, a major championship. But but the point of that was like just how strongly he spoke about his desire to win something with this team. And I think, you know, 2020 was a good example of it. Like it will not be for the lack of Sagerson's trying or his skill that they don't win a championship or this championship that it is the team around him that that is a big part to play and uh, that's going to be interesting as well because there are some of the big stars not involved again uh, and some of the younger players are going to have to to really step up and help out and also the goalkeeper position which is like a discussion every single time for this team like if Torbjorn Bergerud wants to like pull out a Vincent Girard style tournament, this is the one to do it. The thing that jumped out at me was that it seems like every time he moves club or goes somewhere, he has a very, very clear and considered goal in mind and what he wants to achieve. I think when he, and he seems to do it in three year cycles as well. I don't know if that's on purpose, but he was three years in Alborg, three years in uh, PSG, three years at Kiel, and then we'll see how long he stays then with we'll that. But I think he got, he was getting his, his footing in the handball world when he was with Alborg. And then he made it clear that he, when he went to, to PSG, he wanted to win the Champions League. And I think it was part of even their mission statement at the time that he wanted to win the Champions League and plus a few uh, French Cups along the way. Then his move to Kiel, he always wanted to win the Bundesliga. That was his main thing in there. And then funnily enough, he actually won the Champions League with them, technically during a time he should have been with PSG. But we had that, that strange situation with the COVID and the, the Final Four happening at Christmas. And now this time out, it seems like his international goals are combining uh, with his club. As you said, Chris, he has another eye also on finally bringing some gold home for Norway by forming the semi-national team in Kolstad. Yeah, I thought you were going to say his move to PSG, his main goal was to make some cash dollar bills. But uh, <laughs> that's probably a side side goal across <laughs> across the board. <laughs> Well, you can't blame him. We don't have to go too much into the groups or anything now because uh, we're going to do it in deep, deep depth on Monday night. We are indeed. Yes, we're going to have a three hour or at least three hour, depending on how long we go on for, show on the Home of Handball's Twitch channel where the three of us are going to break down each and every preliminary round game and give our scores so it's going to be very, very interesting. It's going to be very, very hard to predict some of the games. So if you want to tune in and see three very frustrated Irish men trying to make their predictions, I think you can't go wrong by tuning in at 6 CETs next Monday night on Home of Hamble's Twitch channel. And a, and a plethora of guests as well. It won't just be us being frustrated. Oh, no, absolutely. We're going to have hopefully some ex-players in the mix, some absolute Hamble freaks in there too. And uh, a few loose cannons. So we keep you entertained for sure. That's it for today's episode. We'll see you next Monday for the live Twitch show. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Sandra Saxon for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Alex. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. It's going to be very, very hard to predict some of the games. So if you want some absolute uh, I wouldn't call it shithousery but I'll call it uh, absolute banter <laughs> <laughs> <You can do that. laughs>